ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to another edition of the Basketball Fiends, brought to you by the RS Fina Podcast Network, and it's me, it's Alex, it's Alex Aguilera, who's doing the intro for today, and with me is Jesus Acevedo Jr., and not to, you know, speak for him, but he may or may not be doing as well as he normally would be. Because uh, most recently the uh, World Series just wrapped up, and as you should know at this point, as a listener, Jesus is a Houston guy, so obviously he is a Houston Astros guy, and they lost in six games. And I am happy, and I'm pretty sure Jesus <laughs> is not happy. So I will let Jesus um, vent, mourn, whatever, whatever he's got to do. This is a safe space for the most part. You know, I wore my Thry shirt, not even like thinking about it, but it kind of makes sense because the Astros have been to the World Series thrice in the last five years, you know, which is a big accomplishment. It is. Right. Yeah, that's, that, is. that's pretty big. You know, uh, obviously it hurts that they, that they lost in six games that they lost against the, uh, the Braves, who for most of the season, they were the better team of them, too. But the Braves, they, you know, with with, with baseball, and I'll say all the time, I, I don't watch baseball the whole season. I kind of get into, like, the latter part of the season, especially into the playoffs. It's just a long season, man. 162 games, just so much, you know. And, and hats off to all those fans that can live and die by each game. That's a lot of games for me. <laughs> uh, when I was younger, I used to be that person. But, you know, life, right? <laughs> yeah, but, uh, that's fair. But I, I will say... The 2019 World Series hurt a little more against the Washington Nationals because they were 0-4 in all their home games. So that one definitely hurt more than this one. This one, man, the Braves were such a good team. They had good starting pitching. You know, the the, the Astros, they were lacking some of their pitchers. Uh, Lance McCullers, he didn't get to pitch in, uh, against um, uh, the Boston Red Sox or against the uh, Atlanta Braves. And... There were a couple other injuries, and we had a lot of rookie pitchers, and the Braves got to give it to them. Tip your hat. They had some good pitching, and, uh, you know, hats off to the general manager. Their whole outfield was redone at the MLB trade deadline, and all those players were key in this World Series and the whole playoff run. So, you know, it, it, it sucks, but, you know, I try to think of the positive. There was three thrice World Series in, in five years, so, you know, it's it's. I remember when the Astros, like, I think I probably mentioned it a couple episodes ago, in the early 2010s, you couldn't give away tickets to the Astros. They were just so bad, you know. But, hey, trust the process. Trust the process. And here we are, right? So, you know, they'll be back. They'll be back. Uh, now the, the the important thing is what they do in the offseason, you know. So I wonder if our guys at Bodega Baseball are going to get into that, see what the Astros do. Although I am already seeing rumors that, that Dusty Baker will be back. Uh, they have a press conference schedule for tomorrow. Uh, it looks like Dusty Baker will be back for one more year. Uh, the pitching coach, though, I, I am sad about that. Brent Storm, I hope that's his last name. Uh, he's an older guy, an older veteran of the baseball scene. He said this was his last year in baseball. He wants to spend some time with his family. And, uh, and also in an interview, he had tears in his eyes. You could, you could tell what it really meant to him. Uh, you know, he did a tremendous job with some of these rookie pitchers. I mean, if you saw some of the World Series, some of these games, the Astros have some young, good pitchers coming up, you know, but they're young. You know, they don't have that experience, uh, so it definitely show. But, yeah, but that's what I'll say about the Houston Astros. Uh, definitely happy that they made another World Series. Obviously sad that they didn't pull it off, that they lost at home at that. Uh, but, yeah, definitely the 2019 World Series, that one hurt a little bit more. Well, like I said, it was, for the most part, um, a safe space, and I gave Jesus his time to – Express his thoughts on the Astros and their World Series run, but they lost again. <laughs> <laughs> they lost the 2019 against the Washington Nationals, who at one point didn't look like they were going to make the playoffs at all. And then they got hot and they beat the Astros and the Atlanta Braves at one point, I believe in August, they had a 0.3% chance of winning the World Series. And what did they do? Like you said, they made some acquisitions at the trade deadline, Jack Peterson, Jorge Soler, among others, and they beat the Houston Astros in Houston in game six and won the world series and everybody except the state of Texas and Delaware is really happy. Delaware, <laughs> whatever. Delaware is so bizarre, but the Braves came in hot and you know what? Who's hot right now? Do you know who's hot right now? Jesus? Cause I know I, who's I, hot right now. I, I want to say they're sizzling, you know, yes, they're sizzling. They're sizzling. Although they were a little, 
Uh, well, you know, we're recording this Thursday night, uh, and this team that we're talking about, the Miami Heat, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. they just faced up against the Boston Celtics, and they actually came up short against the Boston Celtics. But look, you know, when when you're sizzling, you're you're bound to kind of come back down, right? Just just a bit. But we picked them as a first stop because they came out the NBA season smoking, Alex. Yeah, just sizzling. Yeah, they're off to a uh, six and two record. Like you said, they just lost to the Boston Celtics. So prior to that, they were six and one. And yeah, so far, I mean, in the early going, uh, the Miami Heat look to be one of the better teams in the league. Uh, we all know that they um, brought in Kyle Lowry, um, longtime Toronto Raptor. Bam Adebayo came came back from you know the Olympics. It looks like he's gonna uh, he's been making a step forward. You got the acquisition of PJ Tucker. I almost forgot about him. Tyler Hero is talking about how, hey, he needs to be in the discussion of, of the Trey Youngs and the Luka Doncic's in the world. It was hard to really say his name in, in, <laughs> in, a, 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 as plural, but you get what I mean. But anyway, but yeah, I mean, and, and then, of course, Jimmy Butler. I mean, we all know what that man is capable of. But uh, yeah, it looks like the, you know, the Miami Heat have come out on all cylinders, man. And and it's fun to watch after sort of a, a lackluster um season last year after the season before which was like not even two years ago they, they made a finals run <laughs> the bubble year <laughs> right the bubble year so it's uh yeah miami's a fun team look dallas mavericks head coach jason kidd recently said he believes they're the best team in the league and yes they are six and two and they are giving opponents hell because you know me i love talking about defense and entering thursday's game they were the best defensive team in the league they had a 98.4 defensive rating. I mean, they're just smothering teams on the defensive end. They're making it tough for any team to really get their offense going. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the Heat were already good defensively. They had Jimmy Butler, Bam, Ad Bam Adebayo. But they had a Cal Lowry who, while he's lost some quickness, he's a smart, wily vet. You know, he he knows how to take them, them, them charges. He knows how to step into the passing lanes. And then, of course, P.J. Tucker. You said it. he was how instrumental was he with the Milwaukee Bucks helping him win the the Huge. championship? Because I mean, you don't sign PJ Tucker and say, "Hey, we need you to score." No, we need you to just be a dog out there, just you know, harass uh, like like the other team's best players, you know. And there was this clip I saw where he was guarding uh, Kevin Durant, and he was talking about that clip. And you know, Kevin Durant gave him like I think forty five points or something, but and, and he had just hit this tough shot on him, and, and PJ's like, "Do it again, do it again." And, you know, PJ was saying, my goal is to make it as tough on him as possible. You know, he can yeah. go for a 50, but he's going to earn that 50. He's going to remember that he played uh, against Dang. me. And that's really what PJ Tucker does. So you add him and Kyle Lowry to this team. And, man, this team is serious defensively, man. It's it's um, they, They're so good that they're allowing, of course, not counting the, the Boston Celtics game. They were allowing only 97 points per 100 possessions. For teams that is tough they're yeah. going to be a tough out for the rest of the season i think they they might end up being the best defensive team at the end of the season that that's a statement that i'm willing to make based on what i've seen in these uh eight eight games from them you know now i will say one thing that happened today in this Boston celtics game is cal larry rolled his ankle so i wonder what effect that will have although i feel that's going to affect them more on the offensive end than the defensive end alex yeah, yeah, it, it's curious. And like you said, he um rolled his ankle. I think he played like 28 minutes in that game. He only dropped six points, had like seven rebounds. So, I mean, not nothing that jumps out to you. But, yeah, I am curious to see, like, as you alluded to, um, I guess what effect, it, you know, his absence is going to have on that Miami Heat team. Uh, and, you know, I, I think they'll be fine on the on the defensive end. I mean, bringing in P.J. Tucker is definitely a big boost where if a guy like him wasn't there, I mean, Jimmy Butler and I think Bam Adebayo are probably like your two best defenders on that team, can only do so much. And I think they, don't they have one of the Morris twins. They have one of the Morris. Morris. I think right. I want to say Markeith, yes. Markeith, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so he's there too. Um, but I think when you look at the offensive end, I mean, we all know Jimmy Butler is a capable scorer, same with Bam Adebayo, but I think outside of that, uh, like a Duncan Robinson or a Tyler Hero who – those guys, they kind of expect to be um, those other scores for them um, on that squad can be a little bit 
streaky per se. I mean, we both know they can shoot the ball, but you have some nights where Tyler Hero can be off his game. Duncan Robinson, his shot isn't falling for him. So really, out, you know, outside of Adebayo and Butler, I don't think Hero and Duncan Robinson are guys that you rely on too much um, as score options, I guess, consistently per se. I mean, don't get me wrong. They can mm-hmm. catch fire at any point in time but uh you know they they have their moments where you know they just can't uh score so uh yeah i think depending on how long kyle lowry's out it'll be interesting to see how miami responds on the offensive side of the ball now i i will say this so far this season tyler hero has been consistent you know so so i'll I'll give him that and look he's making a push to be the six man of the year he has, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he set a record recently for the most points by a reserve with 157 points in Miami's first seven games. Plus, he's shooting 50% on catch and shoot opportunities. So Tyler Hero came into this season thinking, well, and, and himself thinking, I, I need to take that step up. You know, he, he yeah. made a big statement. Like I said, he made a big statement before the season saying that he belongs up there with the John Morans, the Trey Youngs, the Lucas. That's, those are big names that have already proved it. So Tyler Hero, so far, he's been consistent this season. But I will add that Kyle Lowry has been able to help him in that aspect because this is what he said. He said this is the first time in his NBA career that he's had a point guard who can get everyone organized in their spots. So Kyle Lowry has helped Tyler Hero become a better offensive player. Uh, So I wonder if his production may dip just a bit, not having Kyle Lowry there. Uh, they may rely more on him on uh, uh, to you know be more of a point guard now or, or that that play playmaker role. Uh, but look, some of the stuff that I've seen from the Heat with Kyle Lowry, it just seems like it, it's almost like Kyle Lowry creates chaos, but it's controlled chaos. You know, when you see them, they've been playing faster than in some of the years past. Like Kyle Lowry is looking to run. You know, he may be uh, right. uh, he's uh, an up tempo uh, guy. He's an up tempo guy, even though he's an older guy, but he's an up tempo. He's always looking to push the pace, not even to like get easy layers, but just to get open looks. So I, I am concerned a, a bit. You know, depending how how long he's out, and at the time that we're recording this, they haven't said how long he's out. It could be a couple of weeks. Uh, but I, I think as long as that defense is there, which I think it will be, I think they will be all right. Now, one team that the Miami he lost to on Thursday was Boston and Boston came into this game struggling yes they had just beat the Orlando Magic but before that Orlando Magic game they were struggling you know they're they're sitting at four and five right now to start the season before that Orlando Magic game they had a game against the Chicago Bulls where they had a big double digit lead I'm talking about what 14 19 points out at one time they had a big lead yeah they ended up losing by 14 points so it just you know it just it just they just lost it you know and i feel like they they knew it obviously themselves and they had a players only meeting this early in the season to have a players only meeting it feels like something is just not clicking there with with boston at the moment um you know marcus smart he called out jason tatum and jalen brown but more so i think he was calling out the the offense i know like a lot of people locked onto that quote that he was saying you know jason tatum and Jalen Brown, they need to pass the ball more. But I think it was more so the the offense, you know, and and, and I think um, he did praise them. He said, you know, they've gotten better year after year. But at, at times, defenses will focus in on them too. And if they lock them down, then I guess that's our offense, you know. So so it, it's, it's uh, this was a big win by them. Let's say that against the Miami Heat, who came in here, like we said, they were sizzling, smoking hot. That's a big win by this Boston Celtics team. I think a big win for their personal sake going forward. Yeah, man. And I think one thing I think we should take away from that players only meeting is that this isn't something that uh, just came out of the blue. I mean, we talked about uh, during last season. Uh, with Boston was that, you know, they lacked an identity, you know, they need to find some type of identity because it feels like they're on the cusp or, you know, uh, their roster on paper, like it looks good. It looks like it should be a a contending team after that, uh, after that year, I think it was in 18 where they made an Easter conference finals run. And then it looked like in the bubble, um, they were making a, a run there as well. And I mean, with Marcus Smart's comments, I, you know, not for him to like, you know, bash his own teammates. I mean, I know that's, you know, a little bit, ta- a little taboo coming out in public and just being like, hey, sometimes, you know, teams need a wake up call. And, 
you know, if that's what it takes, I mean, to, to I don't know, make some type of adjustment, you know, for that team. I mean, I guess it is what it is, but I mean, I want to say it was Agent Warjanowski said, you know, it didn't seem like the meeting was all that productive anyway. So is it something, you know, deeper that we just don't know about yet? I don't know. But I mean, I, I, I think it still is a persistent issue with the Celtics that they still haven't um, found some type of identity outside of, uh, you know, like Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. Like we all know that they're young, they're, you know, hot shot scorers. But, you know, outside of that, like what like, you know, what is Boston per se? And I don't think they've quite figured that out yet. I think that's what, you know, Marcus Smart was trying to get at. But obviously, when you mentioned Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, two of the biggest names in the league, people are going to be like, whoa, like <laughs> flags are raised. Like, what's going on? So, uh, yeah, the Boston Celtics are 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 in and have been in this peculiar position where they just can't quite figure out what team they want to be. No, and, and I think I... I like in the offseason when they signed Dennis Schroeder. I thought that was going to help them, you know, give them a, a, a third scorer, a third playmaker. Uh, and I feel like maybe they should start giving the ball some in the fourth quarter, you know. Uh, not so much so that, hey, we need a bucket, like you're like you're a guy to close our games, but just so kind of give other uh, posting defenses a different look. Because uh, Dennis Schroeder can't get you a bucket. But I think also, you know, it's, it's I think, Al Horford. You know, we have to also talk about him. He's 35 years old. He's not the same player, you know. So so I wonder if also defensively, I know, you know, Marcus Smart is mainly their their main defensive guy. Uh, so I know maybe that that, that has also a situation. Because, you know, you know I me, mean? I, I think if a team is playing good defense, all of a sudden the offense starts clicking. That is just something that that, that I think. Yeah, Complimentary basketball in, in, yeah. in any sport. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, but I think ultimately, I believe Boston will write the ship. I also believe that it's a process. They have a new coach in Ime Udoka, who's a first time coach at that. So there's no need for Celtics fans to worry at this point. Now, if things don't get better, I'm talking maybe 30 games into a season, there might be some cause for concern. And, you know, maybe it's a situation where they start thinking, hey, do we need to move away from Jason Tatum or Jalen Brown and just have one of them be the, the guys? Even though both of them have taken steps over the years to get better, uh, you know, Jason Tatum still, he's come out this season kind of struggling, right? He hasn't uh, uh, he hasn't been consistent. Hey. Uh, you know, that's something we said, you know, last season. We, we, we If Jason Tatum can be consistent, he has all the tools. Yeah. So, but we know it's it's too early, and look, that was a big win for them against the Bulls. Big win. They're four and five. So, I guess, look, I guess the Heat, man. Then uh, against the Heat, they, they, they ain't beat the Bulls. It, it, yeah, sorry, the, the Heat. And then um, we also have to say they they had two losses in double OT. So those two losses could easily be wins, and 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 you're talking about what a six and three team or a seven and, and so it's just it, I think they'll be all right. Ultimately, you know, they're gonna right the ship. Uh, but you know who's not doing all right right now, Alex? Oh, you're asking me. I'm asking I thought, you. Hey, it, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I like, like, I thought, I thought you were gonna keep going, but it's probably uh, what you talk, Scotty Pippen, because like I Scotty mean, Pippen. Next, Pippen. Okay, that is our next topic. <laughs> <laughs> like it sounded like you were asking the question, but then you like it was a talk over that, like you were gonna continue, and I was just kind of like, well, I mean, sometimes yeah, I, I do I, that, I do that, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I mean, I know, and then I was like, oh, he's actually asking me. I was just like, but yeah, it's. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's Scottie Pippen. It is Scottie Pippen. Pippen is coming out with the book later this year called Unguarded, which drops November 9th. And he had an excerpt in uh, GQ, and he was very candid about the last dance and how heavily focused on Michael Jordan it was. Here's one of the quotes. He couldn't have been more condescending if he tried. That's in the book. You know, and he wanted to say that him and Jordan weren't close at all. And he just salty. I don't want to say salty, but he's just coming out out of the woodwork and just saying all the all these things. You know, uh, uh, he's just pretty much not a happy person right now. You know, especially about how his portrayal came out in the Last Dance. Uh, he's especially not happy that Michael Jordan got ten ten million for the Last Dance, and him and the rest of the teammates didn't didn't get nothing. Uh, so it's it, it's it's gonna be uh, interesting to see how it keeps playing out. Um, you know, but but. I also want to say that, look, Jordan paid Pippen his respect in the last dance. Here's a quote from the last dance. He said, whenever they speak Michael Jordan, they should speak Scottie Pippen. When everybody says, well, I won all these championships, but I didn't win without Scottie Pippen, 
That's why I consider him my best teammate of all time. Those are pretty high high praise, and I think we can all agree without Scotty Pippen, the Bulls don't win those six rings. No, 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 I don't. No, they don't. <laughs> they, they, they don't. They don't. That that that's just a given. Uh, yeah. I I mean, just with the whole Scotty Pippen thing and him coming out saying, uh, coming out like you said, coming out the woodworks and just coming out with all these comments. Um, it feels a little out of left field. I guess for him, uh, I feel like in years prior, I mean, we never really heard him say these types of things before. I think also one thing, or uh, one thing I would like to mention as well, he actually did lose a son, um, like very fa- fairly recently, and I don't know if that's, you know, that like that's rough. I mean, I'm I'm no father by any means, but that's got to be one of the most horrible things that, yeah. um, or probably the 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 worst thing a father could ever experience is is seeing his son go before him and i mean i just feel like that could be something that's really is affecting him and this is sort of his way to i i don't know i don't like vent isn't the right word but i guess cope with it i mean i don't know like i i i feel like we sort of overlooked that because that was just kind of a really like big big thing that happened to him that's yeah. that's really sad and I don't think it was talked about enough. And who knows? I mean, if this is how he really feels, then so be it. This is these are his feelings, you know, his opinion. It just I think it, it kind of catches everyone off guard because we've never really heard this from him. And now, you know, all of a sudden he's coming out with the book, you know, the memoir. And now he's he's coming out with all these statements. And it's just kind of like, well, you know, where where is this coming from? Why haven't you? you know said it before and one thing i'll say too is that i feel like you know everybody in the last dance was i think treated fairly i think you know the docuseries was pretty objective and you know come pretty much covered everything objectively per se not to not to be super redundant but i mean i like i don't think they the docuseries did anything to really bash scotty i mean the whole thing with him you know not getting um that final shot against i think what was it new york that they were playing I think it was new york yeah right they, they were playing new york and you know phil gave it a to tony and i mean look that's a blemish in 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 his career but you know that doesn't uh overshadow the fact of what an amazing career he had i mean it's i mean they highlighted it it's you know it's one of the you know you know it's kind of a big blemish per se but I mean, who doesn't have it? I mean, look at all the stuff they talked about with Michael Jordan in in that docu series. So, I mean, yeah, I the, the the all the stuff with Scottie Pippen. I mean, I take it with a grain of salt as to the stuff going on with him personally, and just also, I mean, look how I, I like I, I like I don't I don't know what's going on with him, man. Right. I it it, 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 it it it's bizarre. As hard as it is to say, it, it also feels like Pippen will never tire of being in Jordan's shadow. You know, like like the yeah. two will always be tied at the hip. So I wonder if Pippen would have got. I wonder if he would have gotten paid his worth and and not signed that contract that he signed, if he wouldn't feel this way. You know, because I think we all know that contract wasn't a a a, a, a good contract for him to sign. You know, he he signed it because he knew that he needed the money. He you know his, his family needed the money. Uh, but also in the excerpt, I, I want to talk because it wasn't all about Jordan. He also talked about how he felt wrong by the Bulls after he retired. You know, he talks about this one story, I think, in 2014. The Bulls sent him to scout a college basketball game. I think it was Duke against Maryland. He went to go watch Jabari Parker. Not him specifically, but that's a game that Jabari Parker featured in. And, you know, he took notes. You know, he scouted the, the players. So he sent the, the Bulls notes. And then he never heard back from them regarding what he sent them. And then they went through the whole draft process and never one contacted him at all. So he says that he felt, and I quote, it dawned on me they'd been humoring me from the start. So it, it feels like he just also feels slighted by this Bulls team that he gave a lot to. Yeah. You know, and, and then there's even a line in there where he said he talked to John Paxson and John Paxson apologized for how the Bulls treated him. And then he turned around and said, John, you were the, you know, you were a part of the front office for more than 20 years. You could have done something to write this, but you didn't. And then on the on the extra bit says, you know, then he he says, and I could hear John Paxson crying and I didn't say nothing. I just waited for him to stop. So it's like he knows that, that he also felt slighted, I, I should say, by the Bulls team, you know. And and look, I'm, based on what he wrote that, who wouldn't feel slighted, right? Like, like yeah. 
you know, so, so yeah, but, but like you said, it's definitely worth noting about that, about his son. I think what happened earlier this, this year, you know, hopefully. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, no, I yeah, no, you know, uh, no, no, I was gonna say, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something tough to go to. And, you know, maybe this is just, he feels that he needs to let this out now, you know, and maybe yeah. he didn't say it earlier because he was working on a book. So, and I'm sure people are going to read that book yeah. and we'll find out more about it. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. It, it, it's a bizarre situation because at the same time, too, I mean, I think um, the writer of the G, GQ article, um, I believe uh, some of the New York Times also just spoke with him recently. And they said, you know, when they talked to him, they were very just kind of like short, you know, interviews where he didn't really get of a lot of context. And uh, I think it was his comment about uh, Phil Jackson, like he came out with the comment, then he backtracked a little bit and then you know, when they asked him about clarifications, he's like, you know, I said what I said. Right. And it's just kind of like, yeah, I, at this point, like, well, we don't really know what you, what you said at this <laughs> right, point. Right. So it's like, that's what I mean. It's, 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 it's such a you know, b- b- bizarre thing going on with Scotty Pippen. But, you know, I just, I'm, I just want to be sensitive to the fact that um, he did suffer a great loss. And I don't really you know. I, you know, who knows, he may not be in, in the best place you know mentally so it just you know just something to keep in mind but at the same time too yeah just some of the stuff that he has also said doesn't quite add up either so yeah um somebody else that's in uh uh maybe not not all there at the moment is robert sarver the phoenix sun and mercury oh owner who he finds himself in hot water not too unlike former la clippers owner donald sterling alex yesterday released an, an article thursday that details allegations of racism and misogyny during his 17-year tenure so far as the owner of the suns the article written by baxter holmes interviewed more than 70 former and current suns employees throughout his 17 years as an owner and there's a lot of details in there. You know, we're not going to talk about all of them. We'll, we'll, we'll pick and choose and we'll discuss. But one of the ones I found interesting was, you know, when Earl Watson was the coach, right? Uh, they were playing the Golden State Warriors. And Sarber entered the, the locker room and he starts dropping n words, saying, how come Draymond Green can just walk up and on the court, say, and, and this and that. And Earl Watson tells him, hey, you can't say that. And, and he says it again, uh, Sarber. And, and Earl Watson's like, hey, you cannot say that. And you know, it's just there's other damning evidence uh, to, to suggest that Sarber should not be an NBA owner. And look, if Donald Sterling was ousted, and rightfully so, right? So should Sarber. Yeah, man. It's uh, like this guy's a freaking sicko, man. Like just reading that article, I was like, holy shit. Like that's that's sick. It's like hot. Like it, it, it frustrates me that time and time again, we see people that you know are are in these places of power and they go ahead and do these like horrific things the misogyny the the sexual assault like what like you name it like like probably the worst things you can do to to human beings this man did it and he he did it because he's like hey i'm in charge he's like i I could probably get away with it so i'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway and it's you know it it, it's sick and, and and it's so disheartening that you know people within that organization that probably worked there, you know, for years, you know, couldn't go to HR because they felt that they would lose their job, had to go and take antidepressants, you know, crying themselves to to bed because they had to go to work and interact with this horrible human being. And, and it's, and, and it's, and it's awful. And now just moving forward, I know the NBA just announced that they will be, um doing their investigation and then from there you know we'll see what you know the repercussions uh you know he may he may face but you know i kind of i kind of look at it uh in a way similar to uh donald stern and a couple couple people are saying that now in a way i feel like now it sort of unfairly falls on the players that now they have to sort of answer for it in a way kind of respond and say you know hey our owner is a sick person and he needs to go or if not i mean you know who knows you know he's 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 the top dog he's the majority owner so i mean i really hope that um accountability is taken you know rightfully so not you know a a slap on the wrist you know he should not be an nba owner and even more so but yeah it's just it's it, it it sucks that 
you know, we have to hear these types of stories and it continues to happen in big organizations, organization, small, whatever, just in any type of workplace. Here's an, another one that just, uh, oh, and of note, the, the, the law firm that the NBA hired is the same one that they used during the Tim Donahue scandal. Uh, but another interest, not interest, but another like just makes you, like, what? In 2015, when LaMarcus Aldridge was a free agent, he was considering mostly teams in Texas so he could be close to his kids, which kind of put Phoenix out of contention. Sarber said the Sun should have local strippers get impregnated by NBA players so those players will have an incentive to want to sign with the Suns. You know, and 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 it just makes you think, like, who would just say this out loud, right? And I think also in the article, some, I, I, don't, I don't remember who said because it was mostly uh, anonymous. They said, you know, sometimes he will say things just to get out of rice uh, of people. But, I mean, you know, they're some, saying something to get a rise of people, and then they're just crossing the line. And I think statements like that, you're like, what? Like, it's kind of, yeah, you're crossing the line. Right. Yeah, more than crossing the line. Like, that's not just something a, a person says just out of the blue, like, just joking around. Like, just to have the mindset to, 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 to think that and let alone say it out loud is you know, it is, is beyond me. And it, it, I mean, I, I, I think we're keep, keeping it as, as PG 13, yeah. whatever you want to call it as possible. It's like, if you think that's bad, there's a whole lot worse. Yeah. Go read the article you know? and, and, and you'll definitely, there was a lot, there was a lot in there. Yeah. It's, it's a lot to take in. I mean, shout out Baxter Holmes. I mean, yeah. the man did a phenomenal, phenomenal job of being able to, you know, reach out to these people and, you know, allow them to, you know, share their thoughts on, on this really just like messed up, you know, situation. And once again, it's so unfortunate that a lot of these people, they have to stay anonymous because, you know, they got to pay the light bill. They got to find a way to put food on the table. Yeah. Yeah. Repercussions. Now, now here's what's interesting. James Jones, the Suns current GM, he's sort of come out defending Sarver saying that this article doesn't really reflect the man that he's worked for and the man that he's known, Damn. which I don't know what to make of that. Uh, cause you know, that's a lot of people that have come out. 70 people have come out and, and said, you know, right. stories that, that just paint him in, in, in as a racist and a misogynist. So it, it definitely, you know, maybe James Jones has been lucky enough where nothing has happened to him in that regard with, you know, in dealing with Robert Sarber. But uh, so, yeah, I thought that was pretty in, in interesting that he came out and, and said yeah. that. So, and of, and, of, and of course, you know, he's denied any wrongdoing. Uh, uh, he yeah. did say that, you know, that he did say the N word one time, but he oh said that he God. said it to acknowledge the importance of having each other's back, which is just, oh my God. <laughs> just it's obvious. It's like, no, I didn't say it. But okay, the, you know that one time I didn't know that. I just it's just, but I said it in a positive way. Like, okay, no. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> oh a bunch of BS. And and you mentioned the the James Jones thing. You know, like obviously we don't know the full details of obviously of his experiences. And, um, um, to that extent. But when you have so many people, you know, coming out saying the same thing, it's like the ratio is that you know you gotta kind of call BS on that. Yeah, thing. pretty much. Like I like you know even even if he hasn't had a personal experience you know I feel it's very tone deaf very you know insensitive to all those people that have come out you know and and have said otherwise it's like okay maybe he hasn't done anything to you but he's done far yeah. worse to a lot of other people and to come out and you know I guess be neutral but pretty much just kind of defend them indirectly per se whatever you want to call it is yeah like I don't like I don't like that. Definitely not. So we'll see what comes with it. Uh, my prediction is we'll know by the second half of the season whether he's going to stay on as, as owner now, which I believe he will be uh, ousted as owner. Uh, so that's my prediction. And I don't think it's a hot take because I think it's actually going to happen. I think he's going to be ousted as an NBA owner. Uh, so any billionaires out there, you want a uh, team? <laughs> the Phoenix Suns could be up for sale soon enough. Uh you know, Elon Musk or, you know, Jeff Bezos, you guys want to get in on this NBA? This no, I don't think they're going to be any better, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, so far, we haven't seen anything. No, we, uh, we need some. You know what we need? We need a female NBA owner. They, you know, Oprah, get on this Phoenix Suns. Oprah, come on. Hell yeah, I'm down. <laughs> Jeez, That's cool. man. That's what we need. That's why I like MLS. You know, MLS has uh, they have a new team coming out, the St. Louis 
I'm blanking out on their name. Uh, but it, it's, it's a team in St. Louis, and I think it's like majority owner is all female. So that's that's pretty fun to see. Pretty cool. So but yeah. Yeah, so, man. Women women run the world. So pretty much. I'm down. I'm down for. I'm down for it. <laughs> we need to change. We need to change, right? Oh <laughs> yeah. There we go. Well, that's all the time we have for you tonight, people. Come back next week for another episode of Basketball Fiends. We'll see who's up, who's down, who's hot, who's not. Uh, so yeah, thank you for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. See ya. Deuces.